Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 Lacrosse Canada Pro Professional Development Coaching Webinar. Today we have, have five sessions, beginning with our keynote speaker, Glenn Clark. Each session will have a presentation followed by a brief question and answer period. If you have questions, please write them in the Q&A box at the bottom. Uh, we'll do our best to answer any as many questions as possible. All sessions are being recorded and will be available on Lacrosse Canada YouTube channel in the near future. Um, good. So today at, at Lacrosse Canada, we respect and acknowledge the First Nations, Indigenous, Inuit, and Métis people of Canada as the keepers of the territories upon which our webinar is taking place. I'm coming to you from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. It is both an honor and privilege to discuss the creator's game from these territories. Um, uh, today's keynote speaker is Glenn Clark. Glenn has coached at every level of lacrosse from grassroots to the world championships. He's won at every level most recently as our head coach for Team Canada at the 2019 World Indoor Lacrosse Championships, a team which brought home gold. I believe it was our fifth consecutive gold in uh, World Indoor Lacrosse. Uh, he's coached in the NLL, Ontario Major Junior League with Toronto Beaches, and in 2020 was a recipient of the Petro Canada Coaching Excellence Award. Glenn is a re recently retired teacher and enjoys the many sports his children play and has been a lifelong proponent of multi-sport engagement. Uh, welcome, Glenn, and thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Okay, Glenn, so um, yeah, so uh, I'll let you uh, have a little time to speak and then we'll uh, probably have some questions for, for you by, by the end of this, I'm sure. Okay, and um, I, I missed what you said there in terms of an intro. I mean, I, I can get right into it in terms of my thoughts on being a multi-sport athlete and participation in multi-sports. Is that sort of where we want to take this to, to start? Yeah, that, that would be great. Anything you have to present and speak with about that, uh, your experiences as a multi-sport athlete, as well as uh, what the importance you think of that through your experience as a teacher, as a, as a coach in, in minor sports, and, and even as a dad, as a yeah. sport parent. Okay. And, you know, there's, there's lots of literature out there and I'm sure people have looked at it and the advantages and that. So I, I won't kind of get into that. I'll more talk to my experiences of it and the reason why I'm a proponent of it. A uh, little background. I mean, I, I played everything uh, when I was a, a, a young man, tennis, badminton, soccer, lacrosse, football, rugby, hockey, I played it all. Uh, I would say that I played football, lacrosse, rugby, uh, and hockey. At a, at a fairly high level and was able to sustain it all the way through till the end of high school. And for me, being involved in all those activities, there was a couple of things. One, it was, it was enjoyable. I mean, I, I enjoyed being active all year round. I enjoyed the, the different games. I enjoyed the transition from one sport to the other. So uh, I never played hockey in the summertime. Uh, when hockey was done, I was ready for lacrosse. I was excited for lacrosse. When lacrosse was finishing, I was excited for hockey to start, and I never crossed over uh, in those sports. And for me personally, I mean, I know people equate sometimes, well, you know, singularity of sport, you're going to get to a higher level, uh, you get more repetition, more touches. It, it didn't, in my experience as being an athlete and now as, as being a parent going through it, uh, my oldest son is 22 and my youngest is eight. So I've seen all those transitions. Uh, you know, I was able to play university hockey. I was able to play professional hockey. I, you know, I played junior lacrosse, senior lacrosse, professional lacrosse. Uh, I, was, I was able to play Ontario rugby, which was really great experience, uh, high school football. So I, I think from an athletic standpoint, and, and, and I don't know if the landscape is changing in terms of specialization. And, and I mean, I know there's a little more pressure and demands on athletes and, and families to sign up for this year round model uh, in, in different activities and different sports. But personally, I'm not a fan. I, I don't like it. I was, I was a fan of, of, of the variety of sports and, and my sons have come through it as well. Uh, my older guy who's 22, he's now playing lacrosse down at Robert Morris, uh, university, but I mean, he was a hockey player. He played volleyball at school. He golfed, he played tennis. Uh, he played a variety of sports as well. And it, it, it he had sort of the same experience that I had. It didn't, uh, it didn't seem to limit, 
uh, his opportunities. And it also generated uh, a larger scale, I think, love of sport and different activities and continuing to be active and, and being involved in a, in a multitude of sports. You know, he'll play intramural volleyball and he'll play basketball with his friends at the school and him and I'll golf and, you know, lacrosse, he still plays hockey. So I, I think as an adult, that variety of sports as well sustains you. I mean, you're, you're able, and, and let's be real. I mean, we all, we all end up in men's league or women's or older sports as we go along. So, you know, I'm still playing men's league hockey and I played ball, uh, ball hockey till a couple of years ago. So ultimately that's where we get to uh, as athletes, no matter what level we played at and that, that love of sport and, the, and, you know, even the variety of sport. I mean, I've played volleyball, which I never was a volleyball player. I played phys ed class and that, but I just, you know, I would play that in, in adult leagues just because I enjoyed being active and, and the activity. So, you know, my, my sporting history has been very varied. And for me, that worked and I like that model. And probably an extension on that is outside of an athlete, I think, uh, it's helped me a, a ton as a coach because I was exposed to the precision and the specifics of football and, and video and, and game planning. And, 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 you know, football is a very technical, very specific sport. So you take aspects of that. And, I, you know, I played university hockey for a guy who was very prepared and very uh, purposeful in what he did. And you'll take aspects of that. So a lot of my different sporting experiences actually helped me a lot as a coach as well, because, you know, the specifics of games, the transferable knowledge from those sports, uh, information you glean from different coaches was, was very valuable as I went along. So, I mean, I guess in a nutshell, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of it. Um, again, there, there's literature to back it up, uh, but just from experiential and, and, and my optics and, and what I still do with even my eight-year-old. I mean, he's playing hockey now, um, but he, you know, he wasn't on the ice all summer. He, he didn't touch the ice. He, he left when they left, you know, this is an unusual year, but he left, you know, they had some skates in the, in the spring, uh, but he didn't play any summer hockey. He played lacrosse, the, the outdoor program with Evolve. And now he's playing, uh, uh, hockey hopefully for the whole season this year but you know I, I I'm not a huge fan I, I know there's times where the, the the pyramid tightens a little bit as you get a little bit older and, and you start moving towards specificity and you know when when athletes are getting into that 14 15 16 year old and you know if they're in fact elite it potentially is a time for them to to specialize in sports but certainly my experiences and along the way there's a lot of value in being involved in multiple sports and, and multiple act, not even sports I mean activities and, and different things just to stimulate their brain give them variety different aspects of of their activities that'll be valuable moving forward okay yeah you mentioned the transferable knowledge and transferable skills between sports can you speak a little more on that in terms of what, what, what are examples in lacrosse and maybe hockey or football that transferable skills that you may, you know, may, may, be, a, may be a proponent for um, speaking to parents and coaches of other sports who think year round is the way to go? Um, what are some things that we do in lacrosse or in hockey or basketball and whatnot that are very similar or the same that have transferable skills for athletes so that they're actually practicing those skills in another, in another avenue? Well, I think one of the natural ones between the hockey and lacrosse is, you know, we've had some great examples, you know, Joe Newendike, Adam Oates, uh, you know, the younger John Tavares, Brendan Shanahan, a lot of guys that have, you know, been lacrosse, Gary Roberts, lacrosse hockey guys. So I think the obvious one is the, you know, the sort of the subtleness of the, the stick skills in the hands. And I think that does transfer. And I've even noticed with my, my younger boy, my eight-year-old, um, who was playing lacrosse all summer, and right away when he got back on the ice, you know, one of the coaches comments said, oh, wow, his stick handling has got a lot better. You might have must have done some stuff with him over the summer. And I'm like, we didn't do anything. He didn't touch the ice. He didn't touch a stick. He played lacrosse. Um, so there's that skill based transfer. Uh, I think from a sporting standpoint, uh, one of the other things I noticed with with him was 
throughout the summer, one of the things they emphasized was, was spacing. You know, they're playing field lacrosse and not sort of this gravitation towards the ball where you're, you're spacing the field, you're in, you know, lanes, positions, uh, creating passing lanes as a passer, as a receiver. Uh, and, and something else that was apparent when he went back to hockey this year was he, he seemed to have a better awareness of that, not just kind of bumblebeeing the puck and skating around with all the, you know, everybody chasing the puck where he would understand that there's time and place and, and, and being away from the play sometimes is a better position. So skill wise, I think knowledge wise and, and feel for a game is uh, gets transferred throughout the different sports. Uh, I, I remember, you know, you mentioned I was a high school teacher and I was a high school coach for many years, over 20 years. And I, I never played basketball as a, um, as a young player. I mean, I played it in like high school phys ed class and I would play pickup with my buddies, but I was never a basketball player. I ended up coaching the senior, junior, and at the time midget boys basketball team. And I basically ran a lacrosse practice and, and lacrosse systems, you know, from offense, from defense to presses, fast breaks, you know, all the elements that cross over between the sports. And there were certain elements that being a lacrosse mind, I brought to the basketball that even some of the basketball uh, coaches that were basketball guys were like, well, that's an interesting way to view whether it was defense, offense, transition, presses. So from a, from a knowledge and a systematic standpoint, uh, you know, and again, this is from a coaching lens, but it certainly transfers from an athlete's lens. I mean, in terms of, you know, playing without the ball and, and the pick and roll and, and, and playing on the ball with, with setting picks and getting to space and switching on defense. So like those things are ingrained in us and probably more so in the lacrosse, the indoor game, because of the, the physicality, you've got to be a little more proactive in getting off picks and communicating. Uh, and it was something that helped the basketball players uh, be a little bit more aware, whether it was defensively, offensively, uh, it, do that through that game. And, and I was never a basketball player. I mean, I just, you know, I, I basically was a lacrosse coach that coached a basketball team and, and did it for quite a few years. Hmm. Well, the, 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 the officiating piece, I, I officiate basketball and the officiating piece in, in box with the two, two uh, official system and a two official system in basketball with lead and trail are very, very similar positionally. So, the, so from a, an X's and O's type thing, the games are very similar that way. And not only is there transferable knowledge and skills for, for players, but for coaches as well. And, uh -huh. uh, you know, can you speak to some of the athletic abilities that would be transferable between those sports? So, I mean, obviously we've got the, the, the mental aspect and the, you know, the spacing of, Hey, I'm in a, I'm in a five on five setting and I'm working within a space and I'm working with other teammates, whether it's a pick and roll or a, a give and go, but what are some specific athletic abilities that you find and maybe examples of your eight-year-old even who's in the younger ages where physical literacy is huge at this time in his life um, that would be applicable and transferable um, across sports? Well, simple ones, you know, basketball, lacrosse, volleyball, hockey would be that sort of change of direction and explosive power. Uh, you know, you, you need that in, in a lot of the activities. I mean, whether it's football, whether it's rugby, um, you know, with, with even in rugby where, you know, you've got the ball and you're absorbing contact and changing directions from contact, uh, you know, is very applicable to obviously to lacrosse uh, and certainly hockey uh, and even smaller things, creating a good balance. I mean, in rugby, um, you know, you'll have the ball and you'll set up these malls and rucks where you're holding the ball and, and creating a good center balance uh, while bodies are kind of pushing you and, and moving you in space. It, loose balls in lacrosse. I mean, you know, you've got, you develop that good foundation. You're going to get hit from behind. You're protecting yourself. And it's one of the things I teach young players all the time. One of the warm up drills I do all the time is sort of this foundational loose ball drill where you've got a good solid base excuse me, base of support, you're getting low, you're getting the stick low. So it's getting more parallel to the ground in terms of perpendicular. But those are, those are things that I learned in rugby, you know, I've used in lacrosse and that's a very specific strength, um, transferable skill, uh, balance point, uh, which, you know, goes across a lot of sports, but it's being applied in different sports. The physical mechanics of it 
are very similar. I mean, you're using different objects, you're using a ball in rugby, you're using a stick in lacrosse, but the, the, the skills from a physical standpoint are very similar. So, I mean, I think it's, it's endless to be honest, but I think that's, you know, that strong base of support, change of direction, those are very applicable, whether it's volleyball, basketball, um, you know, one of my, my athletes that I had um, in New England with the pro team was Callum Crawford. And everybody recognizes how athletic he was and, you know, change of direction, quick, but he was like a volleyball basketball player. So, you know, he said, you know, a lot of my ability to get vertical and change direction very quickly came out of years of playing volleyball and basketball. So he attributes a lot of his, his success in lacrosse to being, a, a, you know, a very good volleyball player and playing that type of sport. Good, good. So um, we, we see so many kids being pushed to doing these year round sports, whether it be soccer or hockey or basketball. Um, what what would you recommend to parents and athletes who are being pressured into full year activities? What would you try to what, what message would you give them? Well, since you're asking my opinion, I don't want to be the, uh, <laughs> That's fine. the voice of a generation, but my, my opinion would be no. Um, and I, I've seen it when I was a kid, uh, you know, going all the way up, because this isn't a new phenomenon. I mean, I'm 52 years old. And when I was 10 years old, um, you know, we had kids playing year round sport, moving organizations, changing their address so they could play here. Do it. I mean, this isn't a new phenomenon. This has been going on for 40 plus years, at least in my lifetime experience. You know, and it happens now where, you know, even at my son's age, eight year old, I mean, there's one boy who's playing with him. He's, you know, he's, he's already been around to three or four different organizations for hockey and bounced here and all year round and only plays year round. My thought on that is it's, it's twofold. I've never seen a, a high level or a high performance athlete created artificially. And what I mean by that is I've never seen this athlete saying, okay, you're going to play this sport year round. And that equates to high level athleticism. There is a blending of skill and opportunity, which you have to give. You have to give opportunity to good athletes to see if they you know, can become great or lead or whatever else. But I've never seen it manufactured by parents taking them to different organizations, parents insisting that they play year round, parents insisting that they do this type of year round training with this specific coach. I've never seen that work unless the athlete already had some, you know, had that from within. So it is a balancing act of giving athletes opportunity uh, but I, I think the flip side, the burnout side, the resentment side uh, is, I put it this way, I've seen more athletes drop off when they're 14, 15, 16, that have been pushed, 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 and then eventually just normalize back to the middle. I, I mean, with my older son, I, I, you know, he played double A hockey um, all the way up. And, and that was where he was. That was the kind of hockey player he was. And he was a better lacrosse player. But the boys, he played with a lot of these fellas that, you know, were, were going to this organization, were playing hockey year round, doing this. And they were, you know, they were slightly better when they were 9, 10, 11, 12. But it, it sort of normalized as they got to 13, 14. And they, and they weren't the dominant player anymore. And they put all this time in and they'd given up lacrosse and they'd given up this and they'd given up golf and they'd given up everything else because it was hockey, 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 hockey. And they quit when they're 15. And so I'm a huge proponent of, of, of multiple opportunities. Uh, I, I don't like the year round model. I, I mean, I think you can sprinkle some of that in if it's, you know, if we're talking about hockey, for example, uh, you know, the skates at the end of the summer when they're getting ready for tryouts and all that stuff, obviously, you know, you want to do that. So the athlete is prepared, but I, I'm, I'm not a fan of year round sports. Uh, my wife was a competitive swimmer and watching what she did and, and listening to the stories. Um, she was a very good swimmer and, and she quit in grade 12 because it was just, I don't like this anymore. I'm being driven, you know, I'm going five, six days a week all throughout the year, tournaments, whatever else. And, and why am I doing it? I'm not even really enjoying this. She quit and played like high school volleyball and plays, um, recreational adult volleyball now and ball hockey she'd never played hockey before she plays ball hockey now and she won't go near a pool 
Um, you know, so I, I've seen the opposite end of that, where it's driven more athletes away from the sport than it's actually created a successful model. You know, and everybody's going to have the argument, well, what about this person? What about this person? What about this person? And my argument would be, I think they would have got there anyway, because, you know, there's a certain, you know, there's a certain something in elite level athletes that, that gets them to where they need to go. And again, that's that balance. They, they obviously have to have opportunity. But I, I think the elite level athlete, if that's what a parent is looking for, is going to get there with opportunity playing at the level they should be, you know, the appropriate level. Uh, but I don't think it needs to be a year round model. Okay, good, good. Yeah, I had I was having a conversation with with a coaching colleague last week, and one of the things we we discussed was um, the the be, one of the benefits of multi being a multi sport athlete can also be it teaches us how to be a better teammate. Can, you know, can, can you, you know, can you maybe speak a little bit on that, where, wh what you would think about maybe, you know, I'm playing volleyball and maybe I'm one of the better players and on the basketball team, I might be the best player. And then when I play lacrosse, I play, I'm the goalie. So I have a different role there. Not that I'm good or bad as a goalie. You hope the goalie's good, but in terms of their, their communication, they're going to, they're going to communicate differently in those games as well. So can you speak to, you know, the, the importance of playing multi-sport and how, how it can affect you as a teammate? Yeah, I think that's a very good point because, you, you know, there, there's, there's a potential to be, you know, very good at one sport, mid-range at another, you know, somewhere in between that. But you do, you, you get to look from all different lenses of where you fit and, and, you know, sometimes athletes that are at the top, at the top, at the top, they have a certain expectation that this is how I'm going to be treated. This is how I should be treated. And, you know, when they, when they get humbled a little bit in other activities, that's not a bad thing. And trying new activities is, is great for, for athletes as well, because, you know, the struggle is, is a good part of athletics and sports and the learning and, and the, that journey is, uh, is very valuable. So, I, I think, you know, I had a football rugby. Well, I'll tell you one that was interesting for me was, was rugby. You know, you, I, I, I was a hockey and a lacrosse guy, you know, and it's arguing with the ref in hockey, arguing with the ref in sport, parents, you know, kind of getting on the refs, coaches getting on the ref. There's a lot more of that in rugby, the referee, you don't say anything other than yes, sir, to the ref in rugby or you're either getting a penalty or you're getting ejected from the game. So you learn very quickly that, hey, I, this guy is the ref. He's in charge. If I don't like it, I keep my mouth shut or I'm going somewhere else. So I think that was very valuable and very, it was very important to a lot of us hockey guys and lacrosse guys, right? Where you're used to, it's a little bit of chaos with refereeing and, and the fans and, and it became a culture of our sports hockey and lacrosse where it's you know it's it's working the refs it's yelling at the refs it's arguing with the refs and then I get to the sport rugby where it's like you don't say anything to this guy other than thank you very much good game yes sir which was is valuable and I mean it's a great experience because it I, I think people should see that from other sporting bodies because I think at times I mean we've uh, certainly in our game in lacrosse I mean in the, in the not too um Pat, distant past I mean we've had incidents with referees and you know there's always going to be arguments in that but we've had altercations and we've had things that have crossed the line by a mile and you know it, it's a passionate game and it's a it's a, a game where people compete at a hard and high level but there has to be that balance uh you know with the officials you know and we're all guilty of it at, at some point but I think we need to reel that model in a little bit. Uh, and, and something like rugby is, is a great example of that where, you know, you, you don't get to belittle and, and talk down to a referee and, and treat them like they're here for your servitude. Like, and, and I think that's a valuable lesson and it's a valuable sporting model for, for all games. I'd be curious to see, uh, we have Suzanne coming on later and she's, she's been in, in rugby for about 40 years now. I'd be curious to see what, retention numbers for officiating are like in rugby as compared to hockey and, and lacrosse. 
be very curious. Yeah, and 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 I'm assuming that's still what it was is like. I mean, I'm going back to the mid to late '80s, which was the last time I was involved in competitive rugby. Mm -hmm. But that was the that was the mindset then. Is these people are to be respected. You, you you don't argue with them, and you go about your business. Yeah, my understanding is it's still the same today. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah which is really good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's like having the principal on the field. Yeah. The principal on the field, right? Um, no, it was. And it, it's amazing how quickly uh, people from other sports adapt. You, you would bring in these hockey players and lacrosse players to play rugby. And by halftime of their first game, okay, that doesn't happen. We're good with that. Mm -hmm. And it just, it's like a light switch. They adapt. We've even had that a little bit in, in lacrosse where, you know, you'll have, you'll have kids go from a high school field game in the afternoon at school and they'll go to a box game at night and they're completely different in their behaviors. Because un unfortunately, sometimes, I don't know if it's expectations, but uh, permissibility is different, right? In terms of how you interact with officials. And it's, it's a, a culture of the game thing, which takes time to change. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's all parties that got to be involved. It's it's coaching, it's players, it's refs, it's organizationally. Um, but yeah, it is. that's a communication thing for everybody too. And I guess I guess that's that's a, another point that we can talk about is is communication with coaches. And so, like, what are some successful strategies you've had in communicating not only with your players, obviously, but with officials, so that you can build those good relationships with them? Yeah, and it's it's. You know, I, I, you mentioned I've worn a lot of different hats. I'm a very different uh, coach at the minor system with younger players, you know, when I coach my sons in minor than in junior and pro because, you know, it's a different field of play, a different field of competitiveness. In, in minor sports, uh, it, it was always about communication with those officials. My biggest thing in minor lacrosse and, and hockey and those levels is, is, is safety for a lot of, you know, I, the only thing that would kind of get me in a, in a, you know, in a heated communication with official was if there were safety issues involved in the game. Um, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, you're, you're an adult, you're coaching minor sports, you've got a, a younger person potentially refereeing minor sports. I don't think belittling them because you think they missed a, a fast break, too many men change or a, a slash on the arm or whatever you think the infraction may be. Communication with them is, you know, hey, I, I think maybe this was a penalty. Um, what's your interpretation? Why wasn't it and on, you know, maybe in between changes? And you'll get, you'll draw more out of them because the ultimate goal is to make them and the minor game better. And if you have that dialogue with them, and say, you know, I saw this, what was your interpretation? And you allow officials and coaches to have that level of communication. I think it's growth and it's better for both. Uh, you know, it, it obviously at the, at the higher level is a little bit different, but it's still the same thing, to be honest. I mean, nobody likes to be yelled at, nobody likes to be littled, nobody likes to be told their, you know, whatever they get told at, at various different times. And even with the guys at the international level and the pro level, when I've had interactions with them, it, it's, it's essentially the same communication. You're saying, Hey, what, what's our, what's our perception of what this penalty is? What's, what's the tolerance we need to figure it out because we're getting called for this. Why is this? And you, you try and gather information from them. And that's ultimately the best approach. I mean, you know, screaming and yelling and, and belittling, it sets a climate that you don't want. And it's, it's not very effective, to be honest, mm -hmm. uh, even at the highest level. So I, I think questioning and, 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 and realistic questions, like, you know, this is what I'm seeing happening. What's your interpretation? What do we need to do differently? Those types of things. And I think that goes a long way uh, into generating a better relationship with officials. Mm -hmm. I'm going to guess when you first started coaching basketball, um, with, with having your lacrosse background and knowing that in lacrosse, somebody coming across the middle, there's, there's always somebody to meet them there in lacrosse and there's some physical contact. I'm pretty sure you had some conversation with some basketball referees early on about your players having those physical confrontations and probably committing a lot of fouls early on because it was an adjustment 
for you as a coach in, in as a new coach in that, that game. And uh, so I guess I'm just going to kind of kind of pivot a little here and say, what is what is Glenn Clark, the dad in the stands like? You know, how is how do, how are you when you're just you know dad in the stands watching your sons play play their games for other coaches and you know what are your what are your perceptions and you know what are your actions I guess you know if you you know yeah just kind of speak a little on that if you can I I am the quietest parent you'll I I don't say a word I typically sit kind of in a corner by myself and I I don't I've never even raised my voice at a child's uh, youth game and I have a 22 year old, a 20 year old, um, an 11 year old daughter and an eight year old son. And the 22 and 20 year old played hockey and lacrosse all the way up, uh, played some rugby, different sports as well, but primarily hockey and lacrosse. My daughter played hockey. My younger guy plays hockey and lacrosse. I've never said a word at a game and I've never said a word to a coach. Um, I, I'm a fan. And, you know, even the car ride home with my kids, I've never, you needed to do this. You should have done this. You should have done this. I just asked them, did you have fun? How was the game? Because I, I don't know what that does. You know, I'll, I'll do some stuff where I'll work with them. And, you know, we have our basement set up where there's a net in that. And my son will want to do stick handling. And I'll help him with that. But I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's sort of a stretch from what I was as an athlete and as a high level coach where, you know, I had this reputation of being intense as an athlete and, and even as a, as a coach at the higher levels, but at the younger levels, I'm very benign to be honest. Like for me, it's about information. Like as a coach at the minor level, I I'm a teacher and I teach information. I give information. I'm, I'm very prepared in terms of what they're doing and planning and all that. But I don't think I've ever yelled at, in fact, I haven't, I don't, I've never yelled at a minor athlete where I've centered them out and, and said, I've had discussions with the team, you know, this isn't acceptable or whatever else, but I've never centered out an individual athlete at the, at the minor level. And, and to be honest, I don't do that at the larger level, at the pro level as well. Uh, you know, I've blasted groups and stuff like that because it's a more sort of, you know, it's a more intense environment, but as a parent, I don't say anything. Like literally, I don't say anything. I sit, I watch, I wait in the lobby, and I go home. So <laughs> you're, you're kind of chauffeur. <laughs> yeah, I, I literally, I, I've never even, not even raised. Me, I've never said anything at a game for well, however many years that is. I just I watch it. So so there's a lot of a lot of parents in minor in minor lacrosse, obviously that also wear the hat of being coach or team manager and because their kids are involved in the sport and sometimes there's just no one else to do it what what advice would you give to them in terms of how to coach your own child while also coaching other people's children I think they're you know they're they're part of that team and and it 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 kind of works downwards I mean what do you what are your acceptable behaviors what do you want this team to look like um, a lot of it's going to come from your personality so a lot of times your child will already kind of understand those values and share you know what you think is is important so I mean you you put them in the appropriate slot I mean my my oldest son I cut him three years in a row for junior a lacrosse because you know he he physically wasn't ready he wasn't ready to play and you know, we, we cut him from the team and he got it. He knew it. He understood. He, he, he knew who did. So I, I think you got to treat them fairly. Um, you know, you got to support, I, you know, work with my son behind the scenes and help him with this game and all that stuff. But I, I think, I don't know, it's, it's for me with the younger kids, it's, it's about information. It's about teaching. It's about planning. It's about prepping. And it's got to be fun because I, I don't know what the mindset is in terms of that pyramid of parents where they think their, 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 their athlete is going, but ultimately if you're not creating an environment where they want to be there and they enjoy it, w w the retention rate's going to be low and you want them to continue with a love of sport. Like I said at the beginning, I mean, we're all playing men's league, right? <laughs> or, or adult league, women's men's league in my case, or adult sport or whatever. 
Um, and that's where we all get. So you want to have that lifetime love of sport embedded in them. And I've seen coaches that, that don't do that and turn off athletes and turn off families, to be honest. So I, I, I just don't think it's worth it. I don't know what a 10 year old game, you know, you're all competitive and you get excited and whatever else, but I don't see where belittling athletes at that level and, and, and thinking that that's a motivational tool for a young mind, it works. So for me, it's give them information, support them. You can be intense in that environment, but not at the expense of, of, of feelings and personalities for, for young athletes. Mm-hmm. personally for me I was I was one of those kids that played a lot of sports as well and uh, a few times I played where my dad was our, our coach and um, in hockey specifically and uh, one of the things that we had and we talked about it even as a seven and eight year old was when you're in hockey I'm not dad I'm coach mm-hmm. so I don't want to ever hear you call me dad in the locker room and my dad was about as laid back and as relaxed as you could find as a human being. And, but that was one of the things that all the way up through midget hockey, it was, Hey coach, you know, and you know, one day, one day I said, I'll see you tomorrow at practice. And he goes, you don't want to ride home. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. I was, I was just clueless at that point, obviously, but, yeah. um, but I thought that that was a really valuable lesson as an adult. Now I've learned it's like, Hey, you know what? That was really smart on his part was because there was that separation of I'm, I'm just, a, I'm a player, one of 15 or 16 kids on the team and I'm here as an experience and he's the coach for that. And it gave him boundaries. It gave me boundaries. And then, like you said, that car ride home was, did you have fun today? Man. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, I didn't really have, I, I would have little conversations with that with my, my sons, but it was more of an expectation. Like it was kind of how I true, they knew they were one of the group and at that environment, you know, they were running off with their teammates and, you know, it was just, I was coach, they were player and were dad before and after. Yeah. 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 I, I can only remember the conversations in the car ride home were usually initiated by the child me if I wanted to talk about hockey on the way home I talked about it and he would get he would jump into that conversation but if not he wasn't starting that conversation I think the only time that um, I had the expectation conversation was I was goofing around in a practice once and I got an earful on the way home saying you know what your mother and I work really hard for you to play sports and if you're not going to do your best then look you're not going to do it well, but that, and that's, that's a life lesson for anybody. Yeah. And that's a life lesson for anybody, right? That's, you know, that's needed. That's teaching. That's <laughs> yeah, exactly. And those are conversations that, yeah, you should have. And I mean, it's not like I'm, you know, it's not like I'm saying, oh, don't talk to your kids as you go along. I mean, cause there's teaching and learning involved in that. Um, but it was just, I, I never had the, I don't know why you didn't go after that loose ball. I don't know why, you, like I, I was never, in a critical vein, I would ask, you know, what, you know, what you enjoy, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but there, I mean, obviously there's teaching and, and it's a balance, right? You want to give them enough ammunition to get better, to improve, to enjoy their sport, but you don't want to detract from that at the same time. Mm-hmm. And, and it is a bit of a balancing act as a parent, as a coach. So being a high performance coach, um, obviously your conversations with your players are somewhat different than what they would be with the younger athletes, but with the high performance players, at some point we all end up finishing our competitive careers. What's your, what's, what advice can you give to, to those high performance players that, you know, may have played for team Canada for a number of years in, in terms of what are the things can, that they can do to make ease their transition into men's league or whatever we want to call it. Um, and, and to also be able to give back to the game. That is one of the most difficult things, to be honest. And I, I really struggled with that as a, as an athlete, uh, because it becomes your identity for so long. Um, you know, I played into my late thirties in the NLL and, and, and senior lacrosse. And, you know, I, I, I don't know what that length of time is, but you're an athlete for so long and competing at such a high level. Uh, that's a very difficult transition. So the one conversation I have to them is hang on as long as you can, because when you're done, you're done. 
Um, and it is a difficult transition out. Uh, and they've got to find ways to channel that energy. And, and again, it comes from what you love doing, whether it's, you know, working out or whether it's playing hockey or playing golf or whatever. But I think when you transition out of sport, you need to transition to something to give you that, that competitive kind of jam, because it's a very difficult transition. Uh, you know, I still play hockey well, when we were still in normalcy two, twice a week, and I play golf all the time. Uh, you know, I, I really enjoy working out. So I go to the gym almost every day. For me, I need that. It, it's what sort of sustains me mentally as well. Like if I'm not pushing myself and competing and doing stuff, uh, I get very antsy and squirrely. So you got to find what that is. And you got to know yourself. I know for myself, if I'm not doing activities like that, uh, I don't know, it's not, I don't, I don't feel good. And that's why the pandemic, I think was so difficult on a lot of people, and especially athletes was, I know for me being, you know, for some time there, you're, you're, you're basically cooped up in your house all day. And, uh, you know, obviously that was tough on everybody mentally. And, um, and I think, you know, certainly for athletes, it was, it was very difficult when you're used to, you know, competing and getting all that, you know, aggression and, and competitiveness out. And then you're sort of stuck watching Netflix all day. That's, that's a tough, uh, tough transition. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. The, uh, I'm going to just check the, uh, the uh, Q and a here to see if we have any questions. It doesn't look like any, if uh, some of our guests out there have some questions, please uh, write them down there. Uh, if you have any questions for Glenn. Um, yeah. One of the things that. uh, I've really enjoyed is is in coaching is to see the improvement of athletes, especially at the younger le level, like when that light bulb goes on in their head with just a little bit of information. Um, what are you, you know, and, and sometimes as coaches, we, we try to make it overcomplicate, we overcomplicate things. Um, you know, with your education background, with your, with your coaching background, um, how often do you hear, use, um, peer teaching um, when, when you would, when you would uh, have a practice? I used it a lot as a teacher uh, in, I was a phys ed teacher for 20 plus years, used it a lot there uh, because I think there's a lot to learn from both ends of that, from the, um, the one that's more successful. And a lot of times, you know, in a, in a phys ed class in a school environment, let's say you're doing basketball, you'll have players that have played basketball and players that have had no um, experience at all. So it's a, it's a good way to, um, one, uh, break it down and get more touches where you've got, you know, one athlete working with two, um, less experienced athletes. And I think you learn something as the teacher as well, when you have to articulate and communicate and, and present and, and try and, uh, refine another's skills. I think you learn something about that from yourself. And I know my, uh, my younger guy, you talk about that light bulb. He, uh, he played um, with Tracy Kluski's Evolve program this summer. And he was a younger boy there. And just watching the other athletes and, and how much more along they were, without even saying anything to him, he recognized that, oh, wait a minute, that's where these guys are. This is where I am. And we have one of those little rebounders in the backyard. I mean, he spent hours on that because he sort of recognized I've got to, I got to get to this level if I want to be competing with these athletes. So sometimes being exposed to excellence or higher level athletes is, is, is the greatest light bulb and teaching tool there is, because I think especially young uh, athletes and young players, they get comfortable in their own little bubble and they think, oh, I'm I'm good. I'm good enough. This is all I need to be. And then they see another level like, Oh, wait a minute. I've got to, you know, move towards that level of, of, of play and competition. So I think a lot of it comes, you know, the peer teaching model is a great model, but it's also in, um, you know, in, in younger sports where it's the, the competitive sports, I think seeing excellence and seeing higher level achievements and seeing uh, next level skills will sort of light bulb those kids into saying, whoa, 
that's where I got to get to. And that's my whole thing with, you know, my son's played, you know, my one son was a house league hockey player. My one son was a rep hockey, you know, they played at all different levels and I'm always, you know, I, whatever, wherever you fit, that's where you need to be. We're not going to chase this. We're not going to chase this. If you need to move up to this level, then we'll move you to this level, but we're not going to artificially insert you and, and, you know, drive a hundred miles so you can play here and do this. I mean, you, you sort of play where you fit and whenever they get put into those environments and whatever, you know, whether it's a higher level or lower level, I mean, a lot of it, most of it, the time comes from within, you know, they see where they need to get to, they raise their level, their competition, their, their desire to get better. And if they do great, if they don't great. I mean, they're still enjoying what they're doing. Looks like we have a few questions in their question and answer here. Um, what can sport organizations to do to prevent specialization among minor athletes? Come from Dwayne Brad out in Alberta. Oh, Dwayne. Uh, <laughs> I, I worked with Dwayne years ago on a coach's clinic. Um, to be honest, I don't know because you're, you're competing with other entities. And, you know, for example, it's usually not, I, I mean, I guess if you have an organization that is promoting year long athletics, uh, you, you know, you could have checks and balances in there in terms of uh, having time off, uh, you know, very kind of uh, predetermined what the season is and the length of training time. But more often it is, you know, I live in Stovall, the Stovall hockey season is this long. They're not playing Stovall Minor Hockey year round. They're playing this organization in the summer and this organization in the summer. So I think it's difficult because it's competing factions that actually turn it into year long activity in a sport. But certainly if your organization is promoting year long um, uh, participation, I think you need to have a, you know, you've got to have a think tank and say, well, what are we, what's the motivation for this? Why are we doing this? Is it justifying our own means? Is it financial? Um, but I think for the most part, it's not in the best interest of the athlete. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty tough when ice is $200 an hour and we can only, what do we pay 75 for a box in the summer? Yeah. If I'm the ministry, I'm probably wanting ice in there as much as I can too. Yeah. From a business perspective, from a yeah. hockey perspective and for kids, it's not necessarily the best thing, obviously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right, let's see what else we have here. Jeff Dowling says, as a high, high level coach, do you involve your player leadership group in practice planning and game strategy? Yeah, to some extent. I mean, we have a leadership group, we have our captains and, and we have a, a little bit of extension outside of that. There's certainly dialogue on every aspect of what you do with the leadership group. Uh, the, the most I involve them with is sort of team issues and, and sort of the, the environment that we create around the team. You know, we're thinking of doing this. This is why we've done it and have a discussion with the leadership group and then have it filter down. You know, there's sort of a conduit between the players and the staff. Uh, in terms of game planning and practice planning, most of that is done throughout our staff with collaboration. If it's something specific in terms of, you know, we may talk about uh, different offensive looks, power play looks, those specific parts of the game, we certainly will have dialogue with the athletes. Yeah. Because when you get to that higher level, you, one, you want buy-in from the athletes. And through that inclusion with the captain's group, you sort of create that and it filters down through the organization. So you absolutely have to have dialogue buy-in. And, and let's be honest, athletes at that level have good ideas. Yeah, they do. All right, we have one more question. I think this is gonna be, uh, this is a really good question. Uh, from Mequon Tulpin, um, at your level of coaching in the NLL, have you ever taken the uh, Aboriginal coach module certification? And if so, what did you find valuable from the workshop as a coach? I have not, okay. no. Um, and then second part of the question, if not, do you think it should be more important for non-Indigenous coaches to take when leading uh, 
a game or sport originating from Indigenous nations and comprised of so many uh, Native high-performance athletes? Well, I think knowledge is always important. And our game um, and the roots of our game, you know, we obviously know where they come from. And I obviously, yeah, I mean, I think a, a lot of times we we take these um, programs and modules and that when we're channeled towards them. And, and when you're not even aware of them, um, you know, you don't necessarily move in that direction. But it's certainly you know, from talking points and an awareness, uh, you know, there is, a, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of value in taking, you know, different, different viewpoints and different perspectives and, and, and improving your knowledge base. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Um, all of our Canada games coaches, uh, for next year, will be taking the, the ACM and, mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've already taken it myself a few years ago and it's, it's one of the best modules I've taken. Um, Greg Henhawk, uh, was our, del he delivered for us and, uh, did a great job. And for any, any, anybody out there that's interested in, in taking the ACM, uh, just let me know, like fire me off an email. Uh, my email is james at lacrosse.ca and I can get you hooked up in, in your province with, uh, with who, who can offer that to you. I know, uh, I believe Mequon can now is also a learning facilitator for that as well. So. Um, so any, any final, uh, parting words, Glenn, we have about three minutes left here in our time. Um, I know we kind of went a whole pile of different topics here, but, uh, any, any final, any final words from you? Uh, no, I mean, it, it, it's a broad based topic, right. And, and, you know, people have all kinds of opinions on, you know, what it looks like, the timing of it. And I don't pretend to have all the answers because, you know, a lot of it is, is, individual based and, and, you know, experiential and, and all those kinds of things. But I mean, from my perspective, I, I like the, the multiple sports, the multiple activities. I think there's value, you know, again, there's a lot of literature on it, but just from a experiential point, enjoyment of the game, uh, creating some excitement, the transferable um, skills that, that athletes can get from it. And I think, as you move along, I mentioned this earlier on, certainly from a coach's perspective, uh, being exposed to different ideologies, different minds of different sports. Um, I mentioned the football model, you know, being introduced to a very precise coaching system at a young age was something that helped me old, uh, as I got older as well. So uh, I, I think the timing of it, you know, when do you start moving into uh, singular sport uh, if you are a high performance athlete, uh, there, there's certainly need for that. But for the most part, most of our athletes, you know, they, they can keep a couple of activities going for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. Especially if they have those transferable skills to mm -hmm. complementary seasons as well. Yep. Um, I know, I know a number of school boards have, have gone to, you know, no, no more than two sports in a, in a season kind of thing and preferably with one if, if possible. And, you know, obviously we have um, kids who are just super talented and then in some communities, it's just so small that you just need people to fill out your squads too. So, uh, but again, that, that tend, that lends itself to the multi-sport um, model. So. Yeah. And I know, sorry, just on that point, I know when I was teaching as well, the difficult part about having athletes play two sports in a season was, you know, conflict of schedule. So you would pick a basketball team and they're playing another sport and you don't have enough athletes for this game and, and you got to decide which sport. So I think that is part of the decision making in that as well is because you're you're kind of taking opportunities for other athletes and then you're, you're leaving teams with not the opportunity to to compete. So that gets a little complicated as well. Mm -hmm. Well, Glenn, thank you so much for taking part in this. We really appreciate your time and uh, your insights on on everything and I uh, look forward to maybe doing this again in the future. Yeah, no, actually anytime. And hopefully, uh, hopefully through all my ramblings, there was something that people can, uh, <laughs> can grab a hold of. I'm sure there were some great nuggets there for everybody to grab onto. Hopefully. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks.